Oreos lower LDL cholesterol more than statins? Is this the death of the LDL cholesterol hypothesis? But first, make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment for the algorithm. What's up guys, we're back with another educational video and this week we are talking about the lean mass hyperresponder series of papers that just came out. One kind of large cohort, I suppose you'd call it, and then two case studies along with that. And uh, this had been something that I believe was spearheaded by Dave Feldman, who is somebody I've debated in the past, along with Nick Norwitz, who's at Harvard Medical School, who I've also had some, some spats with on Twitter. But you know, I'm thankful Nick actually reached out, sent me these papers, asked me to uh, review them. So I do appreciate that. And then full disclosure, there's also on one of these papers, Dr. Tro, who I've had some, some less than pleasant interactions with on Twitter. And we did do a debate uh, a few years ago that I actually thought went really well. I just want to throw that out there that you know my bias coming into this would be that I'm going to be looking with, at this with a little bit more critical eye just based on my, my past history. I understand that and I'm just being honest and upfront about that. What does lean mass hyperresponder actually mean? I think when I first heard it, I'm thinking people who got jacked really quickly on a low carb diet is, is what I'm thinking about. Uh, because these folks are all in kind of the low carb sphere. And actually what the paper did was it was a large internet survey trying to isolate this cohort that Feldman originally observed uh, just being online talking with other uh, low carb people, which is people who followed a low carbohydrate diet who had very low triglycerides, a lean BMI or a normal BMI, very high HDL, and very high LDL. Typically, what you tend to see in phenotypes of metabolically unhealthy is high triglycerides, high LDL, low HDL, uh, and then you usually see markers of insulin sensitivity that are, are pretty bad. Usually those things go in concert. Somebody who's metabolically healthy will usually, not always, but usually, especially during weight loss, you'll see reductions in LDL, uh, triglycerides, you'll see elevations in HDL, and you'll see improvements in insulin sensitivity. Well, in this particular cohort, they were looking for people who fit all those parameters of metabolic health, in fact, exceeded them, because uh, they were looking for people who specifically followed a low carbohydrate diet and had low triglycerides, so under 70 milligrams per deciliter, high HDL, over 80 milligrams per deciliter, who were normal or lean BMI, but who had LDL concentrations of over 200 milligrams per deciliter, which you're kind of looking for a unicorn population. But they did identify various people in this cohort. And what's really interesting was they found that these folks, compared to those following a low carb diet who were kind of not a low BMI and didn't start with low triglycerides and high HDL, they did not have nearly the increase in LDL cholesterol that the people who were part of this lean mass hyperresponder cohort. In fact, I think the, the difference between the two in terms of the response was something like a difference of like 100 milligrams per deciliter increase in LDL cholesterol, which is really impressive. And then kind of the next series in this was a, a, an individual who fell into this category and they saw a huge change in LDL cholesterol. I mean, this person, when they started the low carb diet, they were at 90 milligrams per deciliter of LDL. And when they finished, like even without uh, an increase in weight, even without like a huge increase in saturated fat, at least based on the food logs, uh, their LDL went up above 300, which is, is really crazy to think about. And then the last case series in this was taking uh, a single individual who, who fit this criteria. So doing a crossover design with a single person, one person, where they gave them either 12 Oreos a day, add a thousand calories to their diet, or gave them a statin. And they did either of those for 16 days and looked at the effects on LDL cholesterol and saw that the Oreo cookies uh, decreased LDL way more than the statin. The data is really interesting. I, I think there is something to this cohort. I mean, it, 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 it seems to be that there is some sort of weird thing happening where people who fit these criteria, you can reliably see an increase in LDL cholesterol. I'm frankly not sure what it actually means. The data itself is not problematic at all. Um, I think it's great. I think it's great people are asking these questions. The conclusions drawn from this data, however, have been really troubling. So for example, people have said, see, LDL cholesterol is garbage, it doesn't matter. No. 
that's not what this data says. Does it elevated LDL cholesterol in the context of very high HDL, very low LDL, and a lean body weight, does that carry the same risk as elevated LDL cholesterol in the context of obesity, insulin resistance, low HDL, and high triglycerides? I suspect the answer is no. I suspect that you do have a much lower risk of cardiovascular disease with this particular phenotype versus your standard elevation of LDL along with all the other things. Now the real question I would ask, and it's gonna be hard if not impossible to get this answer, is all things being equal in this population, if they had low triglyceride, high HDL, good insulin sensitivity, lean body weight, but low LDL, would they be at even lower risk for cardiovascular disease? My suspicion is yes, and the reason for that is we know that LDL cholesterol can penetrate the endothelium. That penetration of the endothelium, that initial insult to the endothelium, can cause the accumulation of plaque. And people will say, well, no, it's not, it's not LDL cholesterol, it's actually small oxidized LDL particles. If you wanna get really granular, it's ApoB that's actually damaging the endothelium, is atherogenic, and you carry the same number of ApoB on a small oxidized versus a large LDL. The issue is people will say, well, small oxidized is what's actually atherogenic because it more easily penetrates the endothelium. That is true. A small oxidized LDL does more easily penetrate the endothelium. However, it carries less total cholesterol to deposit. Large LDL cholesterol carries more total cholesterol, doesn't as easily penetrate the endothelium, but it does still penetrate the endothelium. And when studies look at how much actual plaque gets deposited, it's basically the same. Because again, with one, it's, it doesn't penetrate as easily, but it carries more cholesterol. Another one penetrates more easily, but carries less cholesterol. So both appear to be on balance on a gram per gram basis, equally atherogenic. So if we look at the Mendelian randomization trials where they're looking at polymorphisms on genes that cause people to secrete less or more LDL throughout the course of their life, we do see basically a linear effect of your LDL exposure during the course of your life to heart disease. People will often cite like the cohort studies and say, well see, like it's impossible to know if it's LDL because people with high LDL tend to have a bunch of other unhealthy lifestyle behaviors, which is true. Uh, but when you look at the Mendelian randomization studies, you're taking advantage of nature's natural randomization, which is just because there's this one polymorphism on this gene that affects LDL levels doesn't affect any other area of metabolism. And so it's kind of a lifelong randomized control trial for lack of a better term. And those studies are pretty clear that LDL is very highly associated. Your lifetime exposure of LDL cholesterol very highly associated with cardiovascular disease risk. Now, bringing this back in, in this particular cohort, these lean mass hyper responders, what is the right answer? Should they go on a higher carbohydrate diet? Because when they're on hyper, higher carbohydrate, their LDL was lower, but they also may have had trouble losing weight. Their triglycerides may have not been as good. Their HDL may not have been as good. This is a question that's hard to parse out. What I would tell people overall is that if a low carbohydrate diet enables you to maintain a lean or normal body weight and your triglycerides are low, your HDL is high, your markers of insulin sensitivity are good, I would tell you that an elevation in LDL may be an acceptable outcome in that particular scenario because it's mitigated by these other risk factors going down. And we know that triglycerides are a risk factor for heart disease as well. So again, you know, this stuff doesn't exist in isolation. It's hard to parse out. The question is, do these people, if we followed them in a cohort, compared to people who also did this diet, who have all the other metrics the same, but also low LDL, who, live, who has a greater risk of heart disease over time? It's gonna be impossible, not impossible, I don't wanna say impossible, it's very hard to get that data and follow those people over a long period of time because this was an internet survey and I think they only got a few hundred people who fit this particular profile. I think what they've done is great, but again, it's how broadly this in, is being interpreted is very problematic. I, I think a low carbohydrate diet is a useful tool, but I'm not, this certainly doesn't say that LDL cholesterol is, is not a risk factor for heart disease. This is not what this data is saying. And even, even if we had that data, to show that. That's like finding a subsection of smokers who don't develop lung cancer despite smoking for long periods of time and saying, 
Well, see, smoking doesn't cause lung cancer. No, it's contextually dependent. It may be contextually dependent. Again, we don't have that data, we can't say. Um, I, looking at this does not make me change my thoughts about LDL cholesterol. I do think this is a really interesting cohort. And probably the most sexy arm of it that got a lot of attention was they took one individual. And again, people took this and were like, see, statins are BS. Oreo cookies can lower LDL more than statins, and, and that's BS. This is in one person, a single person. I'm sorry, but a lot of the low carb advocates sharing this, when I share studies that have like 50 people in them that are tightly controlled randomized control trials, and they go, man, the subject number's too low. One subject, one. Got that off my chest. So it's one subject, case study, very interesting outcome. They had it as a, a crossover trial. So they had someone who fit the lean mass hyperresponder profile do kind of a baseline run in on a, on a ketogenic diet. Then for 16 days, had them eat 12 Oreo cookies per day and add like a thousand calories to their diet. Then they had them do a three month washout period. Then they had them do six weeks of a statin, which I think was uh, Rosuva statin. So basically they, there's two arms here, 16 days of Oreo cookies or six weeks of a statin. And shockingly, like very shockingly, their LDL with the supplementation of the Oreo cookies, of 12 Oreo cookies per day, their LDL dropped from 384 to 111 in 16 days, which is freaking nuts. So that was like a 70% decrease in LDL cholesterol. With the statin over six weeks, they saw the lowest point being a 32% reduction and went down from like over 400 to like 284. And then it actually went back up a little bit by the end. Uh, not back up to where they originally were, but back up a little bit. The hot takes on this study have been really, really impressively ridiculous. Like for example, statins don't work or statins are BS. You know, they want you to eat processed food because look what it does to LDL. So first of all, you have to understand this is a single person, a single data point. They also are kind of metabolically a unicorn when we look at the inclusion criteria for lean mass hyperresponders. So their explanation for this is what they call the lipid energy model. Essentially it goes something like this. Uh, on a very low carbohydrate diet, uh, you have depletion of hepatic glycogen stores. And you also have rapid increase in the availability of fatty acids from lipolysis in, in adipose tissue and from your exogenous fatty acids that you consume. And these increased fatty acids availability, they have to be captured somewhere. And so you're getting an increased flux from VLDL into LDL. So VLDL being converted into LDL, and that's leading to increased LDL levels and increased HDL levels and decreased triglyceride levels. That is an interesting hypothesis, but I do not believe it explains the results they are seeing here. And here is why. If that's the case, the reverse should also be true, which is if we lower LDL and we are increasing hepatic glycogen content and we are decreasing the availability of free fatty acids due to decreased lipoprotein lipase from increased insulin, from the increased carbohydrate intake, then we should see increases in triglyceride. Again, if, if, if the reverse is true, we should see more VLDL and triglycerides are actually kind of a proxy for VLDL because especially fasting, VLDL are the major carriers of triglycerides in the body. We didn't see that in this study. So the triglycerides actually dropped. They dropped from 57 to 39, I think which again, we would expect that based on lean mass hyperresponder profile under the lipid energy model on a low carb diet. But then when we add back in carbohydrates and we increase insulin and we decrease the amount of fatty acid flux and we're increasing hepatic glycogen, we should see the reverse happen, which is LDL goes down, which we did see LDL went down a lot, uh, but we should also see triglycerides go up not down, and we should see VLDL go up. Now, they didn't measure VLDL specifically, but as I said, triglycerides are a great proxy for VLDL. I wish they would have measured uh, VLDL to just have that data. But again, I, I, I'm not, this isn't necessarily a criticism because you have to posit a hypothesis to explain this stuff. But I don't think the, the LEM, the lipid energy model, explains the results they're seeing here. And so what is my take home from this? Honestly, I had to call 
my PhD advisor, Dr. Lehman, because I was very stumped about this. Quite frankly, so was he. And we both agreed that uh, the LEM didn't really explain the results. We both agreed that this is very interesting data, and we don't really know what to make of it, quite frankly. If we had to hazard a guess, if you look at insulin and, and you look at its effects on LDL independent of anything else, if you infuse insulin, you do get a drop in LDL cholesterol, and it's probably due to increased LDL cholesterol catabolism. In the research literature, you don't see nearly the decreases in LDL they saw in this individual. So does it explain it? Maybe, I'm not sure. Maybe when you go from a very extreme state, a ketogenic state, to a non-ketogenic state where insulin comes back up, in these particular individuals, you get really enhanced LDL catabolism. Honestly, we're gonna need a lot more data. I don't really know what to make of this right now, but here's what it says. There are a subset of individuals who follow a low carb diet, who maintain a healthy body weight, who have excellent blood markers, except for drastically elevated LDL. And then if you add carbohydrates back into that, at least in this one data point, it may lower that LDL. Here's what this data doesn't say. It doesn't say LDL is not a risk factor for heart disease. It doesn't say that Oreos are better than statins for lowering LDL cholesterol. That's one person. And we are looking at a data set of essentially unicorns. What is my take home advice to people about this? First off, most of you are not going to fall into this lean mass hyper responder category. So this doesn't really apply to you. If you do, if you enjoy a low carb diet, it helps you maintain a healthy body weight and all your blood markers are good except for elevated LDL cholesterol, is that better than you being overweight? Absolutely. So I'm all for a low carb diet in that context. But are you as low risk for cardiovascular disease? Take that exact same profile, but now lower the LDL cholesterol the data we do have would suggest that you're lower risk if you can lower the LDL cholesterol. So if we look at, uh, like for example, the Framingham data, when they stratify people into, for example, high HDL or low HDL and high LDL, low LDL, even amongst people who have high HDL, the people with high HDL and low LDL versus the people who have high HDL and high LDL have lower risk. Then amongst people with low HDL, if they also have low LDL, they have lower risk than people who have low HDL and high LDL. Then if we look at inflammation, for example, CRP, people with high inflammation who have high LDL are at more risk than people who have high inflammation and low LDL. People with low inflammation and high LDL have a greater risk than people with low inflammation and low LDL. So when all other things are equal, modifying LDL still appears to reduce the risk. You can do with that information what you will. I've seen people online like bragging about getting their LDL cholesterol up so high, even though all these other numbers are, are good. I think that's really stupid. I think that's really silly. If you fit in this lean mass hyper responder category, maybe this isn't as big of a deal for you in this specific context. Most of you don't fall into that category. And if you do, I would still argue the data suggests that getting your LDL lower than it is would probably further reduce your risk. But are you at relatively low risk based on all those markers? Probably. But would you be at lower risk if you also had lower LDL? Probably also. This is where a lot of this nuance in these discussions gets lost. So I hope I've added something valuable to this discussion, uh, presented uh, a balanced review of this. I do think it's really interesting. I thank uh, Nick for sending me the papers. Um, I just think, as per usual, the problem is not with the study, the problem is not with the data, the problem is with the ridiculous hot takes on social media around that data. Because data over feelings. By the way, guys, if you want your data over feelings shirt, make sure you click the link in the description, go to the bio lane store, you can pick it up there. Catch you guys next week.